Identify yourselves, um, uh, your name, and what news media outlet you're with. Um, thank you very much. Okay, on that note, I think we'll begin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all here, and thank you all for coming today. Again, my name is Bruce Gagnon. I'm the state coordinator of the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. We're going to make each uh, a short three-minute statement, and then we will be open for your questions. But please hold them until we've each made our short statements. The Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice is a 15-year-old organization this year. We're made up of peace groups and church committees in 40 cities across the state of Florida. We've been working hard for the past 10 years to stop what we call the nuclearization and the weaponization of space. Our organization led opposition to the plutonium launches in 1989 and 1990 called Galileo and Ulysses. And some of you might remember that we went into federal court on both of those instances to try to block the launch. We've been working to stop Cassini plutonium launch for the last three years. Cassini will be carrying 72.3 pounds of plutonium as an onboard power source to generate power for the electricity for the instruments on board on its mission to Saturn. Our concern is that the nuclear power industry has now identified space as a new market. People on this earth are not so eager to use nuclear power anymore and the industry is moving into space. We are now seeing and we're going to be seeing an increasing number of nuclear launches in the coming years. In fact, we have a Department of Energy document that talks about 12 different launches between now and the year 2009. In addition, recently in Space News and Industry publication, there was a report that NASA is planning nuclear-powered mining colonies on, the Mars, on Mars in the year 2007. And there is talk, growing talk, of nuclear-powered mining colonies on the moon as well. The Mars Pathfinder mission, the 4th of July mission, is doing soil identification, as you know. The next Mars mission will be doing a fly around Mars to do mapping of the surface of Mars. And then, as I said, in the year 2007, they're talking about nuclear mining colonies, nuclear-powered mining colonies. In addition, there's work going on right now at Los Alamos Labs in New Mexico and at the University of Florida, where I live in Gainesville, Florida, in the Nuclear Engineering Department. These two agencies are now working on nuclear-powered rockets to Mars with actual nuclear reactors launching rockets into space. What we see now is a conjunction of interests that are pushing nuclear power into space. We have the nuclear labs that for years have been building bombs and are now casting about looking for something else to do in the coming years. We see nuclear academia, like again at the University of Florida, the Nuclear Engineering Department. We see corporate interests, particularly Lockheed Martin. And we see the United States Air Force talking over and over again about launching nuclear power into space. The U.S. Space Command, in fact, is headquartered in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And in their documents, they talk about taking military control of space. They have a logo, a patch that they wear on their uniform that is called Master of Space. And one way they say that they will be master of space is to have the kind of ability to deny others the use of space, to protect our commercial and military investments in space. And they say that nuclear power is the linchpin as they move forward to create the weapon systems so that they can have control and be master of space. We believe that with an increased launching of nuclear power uh, substances from Cape Canaveral, that there will be an accident eventually. When you have rocket failure rates of 10 to 20 percent, it's only a matter of time that there will be an accident, either in Florida or globally. So in fact, this is not just a Florida issue, it's truly a global issue. That's why we in 1992 founded the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And we've been organizing internationally since 1992 on these issues. Just this past spring, we went to four countries in Europe, and we are now receiving support and calls from all over the world. We are not opposed to space exploration. I want to be very clear about that. But we are opposed to carrying what we see as a bad seed into space. NASA and the Air Force are now poised to launch these bad seeds into the heavens. President Clinton has final launch authority of Cassini. 
and we call upon him to cancel this mission and to order NASA and the Department of Energy, who are now pushing nuclear power in space, we call upon the President to order them to develop the solar option. We call upon Congress to hold open public hearings. The people of the United States are funding this Cassini mission at three and a half billion dollars. We are the people who will suffer the risk if there is an accident. We believe in this so-called democratic society that we should at the very least be allowed an opportunity to have a public open debate on this where the people are given a chance to speak. Now is the time for the people to speak because as we get closer to the launch hour, it looks as though we're being crowded out from this opportunity to have an open, honest debate in this country. We believe that there are moral questions at stake here, that there are ethical questions at stake, that there are environmental questions at stake, and there are questions of peace. We cannot allow nuclear power to be launched into space. We cannot allow the space program to be used as a nuclear waste disposal program. We cannot allow space weapons to be tested and deployed in space. On October 4th, we're holding an international demonstration at Cape Canaveral, Florida. We've received word now from people from at least 30 states who say they are coming to that demonstration. On September 20th, there's a demonstration in New York City at the United Nations. On September 28th, there's a demonstration at the White House. And in fact, this afternoon at 1 o'clock, there's a vigil going to be held at the White House. And we're going to attempt to present petitions that we've gathered from around the world. There are other demonstrations now being planned in Seattle, St. Louis, Massachusetts. We're beginning to hear from people. Germany is holding a demonstration. We've just heard from India as well. I want to, before I go on in, in conclusion, introduce one person who's in the front row. Her name is Louise Rem Franklin Ramirez. She's 92 years old. She's going to be one of the women who is going to make the attempt, the first attempt, to sit on the launch pad. Louise, would you please stand up? <laughs> Louise is from Virginia. There's an 87-year-old woman from Florida. There's an 82-year-old woman from Iowa. And there's a 74-year-old woman from California. These women are going to lead the effort to enter the base after October 4th demonstration to sit on the launch pad in a symbolic effort to block the launch. In recent days, we've been hearing on national media and seeing in papers across the country that NASA has been saying that they're worried about sabotage. In fact, last night, we're, I'm, I've been told that CNN was running a story about sabotage with pictures of our demonstrations in past years at the Space Center. I'm told that when asked if NASA has any evidence of any sabotage by our organization or by protesters, the answer was an emphatic no. Well, you know, there's an old PR maxim. It goes like this. Don't manage the problem, manage the outrage. And what I would submit to you, NASA is now doing is a horrific example of trying to manage the outrage. People all over the world are outraged at this launch, and they're now trying to discredit those citizens who are opposing it by saying somehow that they might be doing sabotage to this mission. In fact, just last uh, Thursday, I received a call from the NASA security at the Kennedy Space Center, a man by the name of Jan Sinkner. He called me to find out if our October 4th demonstration was still on following this recent delay. And I told him it was. And then I told him that we were quite upset with the growing stories that we're seeing around the country about sabotage. And he said, oh, Bruce, you don't understand. We're not talking about you. Well, I said, well, who in the world are you talking about? He said, we're talking about our own employees. I said, you mean you don't even trust your own employees? He said, Bruce, you know you've got a lot of support inside the Space Center amongst our workers. Well, I want to reassure NASA that we have a 15-year-long history of nonviolent work in this country, and in, particularly in the state of Florida. And I want to assure them that we have no intention whatsoever of sabotaging the mission. The mission. We are going to use the democratic gifts that were given to us in this country the things that we're told makes this country better and different from everyone else, we're trying to use those gifts to stop this launch. 
But in the Gandhian tradition and in the tradition of Martin Luther King, if we're unable to, through legislative appeals and appeals to the, to the president, if we're unable to stop this launch, we do indeed attempt to enter the launch facility to nonviolently sit on the launch pad. I would now like to introduce the other speakers. I'm going to introduce all of them, and then they will come up one at a time. The first speaker will be Dr. Michio Kaku, professor of physics from the City University of New York. He will be followed by Alan Cohn, who for 30 years worked for NASA, and during 89 and 90, during the Galileo and Ulysses plutonium launches, was the emergency preparedness operations officer for those missions. Dr. Jan Kirsch, who flew all the way here from California at her own expense, is an oncologist and an expert in the medical effects of plutonium. Kitty Beniski is with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And then Carl Grossman will wrap it up. He is a professor of journalism at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. So, Michio Kaku. Thank you. My name is Dr. Michio Kaku. I'm the Henry C. Matt Professor of Nuclear Physics at the City University of New York. My press statement is outside. I've been a professor of physics for the past 25 years. And many of my textbooks are required reading for PhD students in almost all the major physics laboratories on the planet Earth. I believe in the space program. I believe that the destiny of humanity ultimately lies, perhaps, in outer space. However, as a physicist, I've gone through the final environmental impact statement line by line, computer program for computer program, and very deeply disturbed at what I found. I find that the NASA bureaucrats, in some sense, are living in fantasy land. They've taken the most optimistic figures. Pure guesswork has replaced rigorous phys physics. Many of these numbers are simply made up in the final environmental impact statement. NASA scientists are making the worst mistake that a scientist can ever make, and that is to believe your own press release. There's something more powerful than a NASA press release, and that is the laws of physics. And the laws of physics tell us that a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. The two weakest links in the chain are one, human failure, and two, the design flaws in the spacecraft itself. Now, let me explain. When I go through these computer codes, I get numbers like one in a million for an accident. Where do these numbers come from? They come from what is called single event tree analysis, which is the same analysis that missed Three Mile Island. The discredited computer codes used in the commercial nuclear power industry that missed Three Mile Island, that missed Chernobyl, are the same computer codes used by NASA. We don't trust them. We shouldn't trust these computer codes here. Because how do you quantify human error? How do you put a number on human stupidity? You can build a car with airbags, anti-lock brakes, seat belts, the one in a million car, and then some bozo is going to drive it over a cliff. How do you put a number on that? The Hubble Space Telescope, a billion dollar fiasco in outer space. What was the reason for that? In Danbury, Connecticut, we now know that an engineer inserted a ruler in backwards, and that partially caused the sequence of events which led to a billion dollar fiasco in outer space. How do you put a number on human stupidity? You can't. You look at the track record. And what is the actual track record, the operating experience? The weak link in the chain, the other weak link, is booster rocket failure. Booster rocket failure is 1 in 20 for the Titan IV missile. Would you put a bullet in a gun with 20 chambers on it, point it at your own child's head, and pull the trigger? That's what NASA is asking us to do, because that is the weak link in the chain, one in 20. Now, let's say there is a misfire, and let's say it does come streaming down like a meteorite from outer space. We have this flaming meteor from outer space, 30% disintegration of the fuel, according to NASA's own estimates. It will come plunging down, creating a cigar-shaped footprint on the planet Earth. However, NASA admits that only 2,300 people could come down with fatal cancer as a result of this. 
Why such low figures of 2,300 from NASA's own environmental impact statement? The reason is, and I was shocked when I saw this, and this is where the deception begins. They assume that almost all the plutonium is concentrated within two square miles of the impact site. Ladies and gentlemen, NASA bureaucrats have discovered a new law of physics. The winds do not blow when there's a nuclear accident. Look at the track record. In 1978, Cosmos 954, a dying Russian satellite with 100 pounds of enriched uranium, came flaming down from outer space, disintegrated high in the atmosphere, and landed in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Did it deposit its deadly cargo within two square miles? No. Contamination area was 124,000 square kilometers. Look at the track record. Look at the experience of space probes that have failed. One in a million. Does that mean that we have fired a million space probes into outer space and only one has failed? No. About 20% of our space probes encounter some kind of failure. The other question is, are there alternatives? NASA is correct in one statement. As presently constituted, solar will not work on the Cassini space mission because Cassini is overweight. At 13,000 pounds, it is overweight by 1%. It's overweight by 130 pounds. My solution is to downsize Cassini. If it's good enough for Wall Street, if it's good enough for the Mars rover, it's good enough for NASA. This is the mother of all plutonium launches, with 72 pounds of plutonium. But it's also the Cadillac of all space missions, bloated with scientific equipment that's redundant. We don't have to go to Titan and Saturn at the same time. Instead of sending this Cadillac into outer space, why not send two small compacts into outer space, energized by solar? So solar can do it. This is a leftover from the Cold War, when we had gigantic space probes to compete with the Russians. The new philosophy was set by the Mars rover. Small, fast, cheap, better, and downsized. And that's going to be the future of all such space missions. So in conclusion, I want to say, I'm here to try to save the space program from NASA bureaucrats. NASA bureaucrats are trying to fabricate new laws of physics that I've never seen before in any of my textbooks, in any of the books that I have published for PhD students. In fact, if any of these engineers were to submit that report to me for a course, I would flunk them. <laughs> Fabricated numbers, pure guesswork, masquerading as genuine authoritative numbers. And that's why in conclusion, I would ask President Clinton to cancel the Cassini space mission. I am Alan Cohn. On the Galileo and Ulysses missions, I was the emergency preparedness operations officer at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, responsible for the safety of government employees, the contractor and industrial employees, and all the tenants in the entire area of, uh, oh, about six times the size of Manhattan Island. The friends that Bruce was referring to that we have at the uh, Kennedy Space Center, they're safe during the launch because of the work that I did. All of the major government buildings will be converted into fallout shelters. People working outside will be in whole body bunny suits with gas masks and a heap of filters. But their friends their families, their neighbors, their children, their grandparents, just outside the government fences, they're not protected from the fallout. So no wonder we have friends at the Kennedy Space Center. And no wonder they're worried about their own employees. I'm going to depart from the handout that you'll find immediately outside those doors because of some recent things that have happened not just to me, but to all of us who are trying to bring you the truth. 
The government has resorted to telling the sneakiest of all kinds of lies, the half-truth, the, the sin of omission, the truth not told, what the Talmud, a book of Jewish wisdom, calls stealing the mind. First such lie is that Cassini is the last launch scheduled to carry plutonium. And it's true. It's the last one on the schedule. That's a semantic trick that they've pulled. They've gotten away with it, too. According to it's the statistics we got from the Department of Energy, there are about 12 of such plutonium-carrying launches scheduled over the next 12 years. If you cross the street with your eyes closed often enough, you may get by the first or second or third or fourth time, but eventually you're going to get run over. I don't know if that's in the laws of physics or not, doctor, but it certainly is in the laws of common sense. The second lie is that the RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, the plutonium capsules, in other words, are indestructible. Nothing designed by man is indestructible. Common sense will tell you that, too, particularly in the, in the fire and the fury, which I've seen often enough after spending more than 30 years out there. In the fire and fury of a, of a rocket explosion, no one can tell me that anything that's in that uh, capsule can be in, uh, indestructible. That's just nonsense. Then the idea that no plutonium can escape over a populated area, that lie has been promulgated also. But NASA's own final environmental impact statement shows a six-county area that can be polluted by plutonium carried by the winds. I've said nothing about the water. I don't think the environmental impact statement says anything about the water either. If you uh, put a basement in a house in uh, coastal Florida, you have an indoor swimming pool. The water table is just under the ground. In a Florida rainstorm, no one can tell me that plutonium, the heaviest stable element known and manufactured by man, wouldn't get to groundwater. And after it got to groundwater, I can see why NASA didn't want to mention it. Who could control it in, once it got to groundwater? There are underground rivers all over that state. Nobody would know where that plutonium would go. It doesn't take very much to give you a carcinogenic dose. I'll leave that to uh, the good doctor to explain. I've been told that even a uh, millionth of a gram, a microscopic portion, ingested by breathing, drinking, or eating, would be enough to do, do you in. You wouldn't die right away. It would be slowly in agony. Okay, what are the lies? Yes, the idea that in the uh, flyby, the gravity whip or uh, uh, slingshot, that if we had an inadvertent reentry, that each person would only receive one milligram, the equivalent of one dental x-ray. That's the worst lie of all. It would be true if we were rocks. But we are living, breathing human beings who do eat and drink and breathe. And so that, that lie doesn't really count for any, any common sense either. In other words, I'm saying that the government is deliberately putting out a disinformation campaign. I don't care about the discrediting campaign. With a panel like this, obviously, you can see we, we have the knowledge. And there are many, many more people who have joined us who have uh, advanced degrees. Uh, mud fuds, MD, PhDs, like Dr. John Goffman, many others who agree with us. And if there's any question at all, if there's any controversy at all, you can't take the risk. You can't do the launches. I worked for NASA for a little less than 30 years. I expected better from my ex-bosses and from my co-workers. Tell you the truth, the whole thing hurts my feelings. It hurts my feelings to have to stand here in front of you and, t and say such things about, about NASA. I loved NASA. It was the best job I ever had doing the most exciting work that I ever saw. And I'm sorry that this has happened. And I apologize to you, to you for doing the work of the, of the EPO, the Emergency Preparedness Operations Officer. It hurts my feelings that the people who will do this launch and the others will be protected. 
but that the rest of the people will not. My name is Dr. Jan Kirsch. I'm an oncologist. I, I treat cancer and leukemia. Currently, I'm, I'm studying, doing research, trying to prevent cancer. Projects like Cassini make that, that battle, that battle to prevent cancer, a very um, uphill battle indeed. The fact that, that a risk of dispersion of plutonium over billions of people, a sort of um, malignant roulette, um, a lethal uh, kind of lottery is being undertaken, I find, I find unconscionable. I want to put to rest certain ideas that have been promulgated about the toxicity of plutonium, which is thought to be, oh, well, paper will stop it, it can't hurt you, you can uh, probably eat it in sandwiches. And th there's some very basic things I'd like to talk to you about. Plutonium is a radioactive element that is man-made, um, at least on this planet. I think in supernovas it may be still being created, but God has stopped making it here. Um, she does in maybe outer space. To an, to an oncologist, to paraphrase Shakespeare, plutonium is the stuff that nightmares are made of. Numerous studies of plutonium and similar radionuclides have shown that it is highly carcinogenic in animals and in man. Um, in, in studies in beagle dogs, just a handful of micrograms, a few millionths of a gram, when deposited in their respiratory tract, cause nearly all the dogs to get cancer. Um, it is very important that such tiny particles, if an accident occurs, an explosion, a burning of plutonium, could subject millions, possibly billions of people on this planet to the same kind of tragedy. A little bit about the biology. Once inhaled, plutonium particles will adhere, will dwell in the lung and the pulmonary lymph nodes, the lymph glands that drain the lung. And they'll stay there for a long, long time. Um, they can be translocated by the blood, removed by the blood to the surface of the bone called the periosteum where they can um, cause other problems we'll get to. But while they stay there in the lung, in the lung surface, they stay there and constantly bombard that tissue with highly carcinogenic alpha particles. Let me talk about that one milliram a little bit. That's, that's a thousandth of a rem. Studies have shown that if you take one alpha particle, that means one plutonium emitting one of its breakdown products, and you shoot that through one nucleus of a cell, you give that cell a hundred rads, not a thousandth of one, but a hundred. Now, the kind of plutonium that you are likely to inhale after an accident would involve thousands of such atoms, many thousands, and you are likely to get many thousands of rads to that sensitive lung tissue, a very adequate amount to cause cancer. Five years later, 10 years later, 30 years later, even in people who are healthy and never smoked, even in children. Now, some of the plutonium uh, to be, to be complete will be translocated, taken by the blood. A little tiny bit will, will be removed by the kidneys, but most of it will stay with you for life. Plutonium, like a diamond, is forever. But it's really, uh, unlike a diamond, not anyone's best friend. Um, it, it can get translocated to the, to the surface of the bone where it can cause a rare disease called osteogenic sarcoma. Recent data shows it can also be translocated or, or taken to breast, to the testis, to the liver where it can increase the rate of cancer in those organs. And as I said, these are millionths of a gram quantities. Now, here is where plutonium is unlike any other carcinogen that, that we can think of. In general, when you think of something that causes cancer, you assume you have to have multiple exposures before you get cancer. And in general, that it, truism tends to be true. But think of cigarettes. If you smoke one, you're probably not going to get cancer, even a pack. I'm not encouraging this, but, but that's the truth. One encounter, however, with plutonium is not one exposure. It stays there, bombarding that, the sensitive tissue with those particles I just spoke with you about year after year. The radioactive half-life, after which only half of it's gone, is 88 years. So it's continuously causing multiple exposures throughout your life, even though you may have never known you contacted it, never known that you inhaled it, 
So there's no, this is a case where one exposure can lead to cancer one time. Um, and it's, it, th this is something that's very important that, to remember that one individual with one exposure can be, um, can, can get cancer. It's not a milliram. It is when the exposure occurs continuous. As a physician who at times utilizes radiation to treat, to diagnose, to treat cancer, I have a great deal of respect for radiology, for nuclear medicine, and use it. On the other hand, what I'm asking for here today is, is just informed consent. That is, when medicine is practiced well, and I mean, even despite managed care, that does happen occasionally. It, it, no, it really does happen. When, it's, when medicine is practiced well, we adhere to something called informed consent. You don't do something to a patient without telling them about it. I can't go randomly through a mall to do a study and do barium enemas on people at, you know, besides being rude, it, it doesn't invoke informed consent. And that's all we're asking for here. There is a societal version of informed consent and it is called democracy. And that's what we're, we want. To loft a highly carcinogenic substance into the air over an entire population is an abrogation of that ideal of democracy and informed consent. And it's ironic that a country that really does seem to aspire to be the greatest of democracies would subject its people and the world's people to irradiation without representation. Democracy prevents cancer. Thank you. My name is Kate coburn Beniski, and I speak for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. The League is a, l a little more than angry today. We're angry that we find it necessary to oppose what could be a great step forward in humankind's understanding of the universe in which we live. We're angry because we remember the thrill that we all felt in the early days of the space pro program before NASA became contaminated by a militaristic agenda, before plutonium became the fuel of choice. Our organization is adamantly opposed to the Cassini Project and are joining with concerned citizen groups all around the world to implore President Clinton to bring it to a halt, unless and until it can be redesigned to run on the solar cells that we now know are available. At our International Congress, which happened earlier this year, uh, this Congress represents concerned citizens in 43 countries, and we passed a resolution condemning the Cassini mission. The president of our U.S. section sent, sent letters and background materials on Cassini to the major embassies here in Washington and to key people at the United Nations and our local chapters have organized letter writing campaigns and public meetings to get the world word out all across this country. Some of you may have seen our ad which appeared today in the New York Times on the op-ed page of all places. Uh, and we are passing the hat among our members to pay for that. Uh, the heading of, of the ad says the most censored story of the year and that's what it really is. We are, as you can see, going all out to use a, a, an expression that goes back to the Vietnam War era to take this dangerous toy away from the boys. We consider the Cassini probe with its deadly load of plutonium-238 to be the most foolhardy risk to public health ever undertaken by modern science. By their own admission, NASA's top scientists know the danger why then did they persist in choosing plutonium over solar? Dr. John Pike, director of space policy of the American Federation of Scientists, has a pretty good idea why. He says, quote, it is possible to use solar power for deep space missions, but Cassini is not designed for solar. If they took the time to redesign, the project could get canceled and the spacecraft might end up in the Smithsonian. So in effect, this means that NASA is willing to risk a possible public health disaster rather than lose funding for this project. What sort of morality is that? Whatever happened to compassion or even enlightened self-interest? 
If it blows up on the launch pad, Cape Canaveral will be unusable, perhaps for years while cleanup is attempted, and we know more about that now after hearing Dr. Cohn. What would that do to the whole space program? Get real, guys. Aside from our concerns about plutonium contamination in case of an accident, either on launch or flyby, Women's International League, an organization concerned with human needs, has real doubts about the wisdom of completing on a hurry-up schedule a project which will cost American taxpayers at least $3.4 billion. Could not some of those dollars be put to better use, providing low-cost housing, medical care for uninsured children, or even applied to the national debt, for heaven's sake? As one of our staff members remarked, Saturn will still be there if we wait a couple of years and do this project right. One other important and little discussed reason to oppose Cassini is the fact that if we accept the use of plutonium fuel in a space probe, it makes that, it, that much easier for the U.S. Space Command to implement the scenario contained in its document, Vision for 2020. In that document, it says that, quote, Space forces will emerge to protect military and commercial interests and investment in the space medium. There will be a critical need to control space to ensure U.S. dominance. Robust capabilities to ensure space superiority must be developed, end quote. This is clearly in violation of the 1967 United Nations Treaty on Outer Space, which says that the moon and all other celestial bodies are to be free from, for exploration and use by all states. Another provision of that treaty that needs to be considered is the case, in the case of a Cassini explosion, is that the launching state is liable for damages to persons or property of another state resulting from its space activities. How could the United States even come close to compensating for millions of cancer deaths all around the world. Obviously, it could not. I'd like to end, if I may, on a personal note. My daughter is awaiting the birth of her third child, and we know it's going to be a little boy. He will live most of his life in the 21st century, and I'd like to think he would have a chance to grow up strong and healthy on a habitable planet under a sky filled not with nuclear battle stations, but only with stars. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Grossman. I'm a professor of journalism at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. I'm the author of the book, The Wrong Stuff, The Space Program's Nuclear Threat to our planet. It's just out. I'm also writer, writer and narrator of the video documentary Nukes in Space, the Nuclearization and Weaponization of the Heavens. After more than 10 years of journalistic investigation, it's clear to me that NASA is taking unnecessary risks and endangering people and the planet by its use of plutonium on space devices. And it's also not being honest with the public about there being a solar alternative to nuclear power. I got started on the story in 1985 when, from a government newsletter, I learned about two plutonium-fueled space probes to be lofted by space shuttles in 1986. One of those shots was to be the ill-fated Challenger's next mission. NASA and the Department of Energy blocked my inquiries under the Freedom of Information Act about the consequences of an accident, and NASA insisted nothing to be concerned about the likelihood of a catastrophic shuttle accident is one in 100,000. Then came the mid-air explosion of the Challenger. NASA promptly changed its odds of a major shuttle accident to one in 76 where they remain today. In science, one only knows true probability by empirical evidence, by reality. NASA rescheduled those shots, insisting, meanwhile, there was no option but to use plutonium on them. Indeed, right here in federal court in Washington, people from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory literally swore on the Bible 
that there was no alternative but plutonium on the Galileo shot in particular in connection with the suit brought by the Florida Coalition and others. In those two years, NASA stonewalled my requests under the Freedom of Information Act on its data on alternatives to plutonium. Only after the Galileo plutonium fuel probe was launched, two weeks after, did NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory re release NASA analyses to me like this one, which concludes, let me just read from the top, and the summary says the same thing. Study results indicate that a Galileo Jupiter orbiting mission could be performed with a concentrated solar array power source. Conclusion, no insurmountable system level barriers preclude the use of a concentrated solar array on this mission. NASA, some says it stands for never a straight answer. <laughs> With all due apologies to the delegation from NASA here led by PR person Savage sitting back there. The NASA PR people, including Mr. Savage, spin a tale that their nuclear space program has been a success. But in reality, three of its 26 nuclear space shots have met with mishaps, including the SNAP-9A, which disintegrated as it fell in 1964, spreading plutonium all over the Earth. Now it's Cassini with more plutonium than ever put on a space device. The launch on a Titan IV rocket with a 5% failure rate is only one disaster waiting to happen. Then there is the 1999 Cassini Earth flyby. The probe and its 72.3 pounds of plutonium dioxide is to come hurtling back at the Earth. And if there is what NASA calls an inadvertent re-entry of Cassini into the Earth's atmosphere on that flyby, with Cassini breaking up and dispersing plutonium, as NASA admits it will, then, I mean, here it is in the... My specialty is investigative reporting. Go to the government documents. Here in NASA's own environmental impact statement, and I have copies of this for you, is the consequences of that kind of accident. They talk about, let's see if I can find it quick. Uh, I have a, uh, a copy here. What, what they, I know it by heart. What they talk about is this in an, in an inadvertent reentry and this Cassini probe disintegrates, breaks up in the atmosphere, then five billion of the Earth's estimated seven to eight billion world population in 1999, that amount of population are expected to receive 99% or more of the radiation exposure. But, says NASA, again, picking numbers out of the air, that's only a one in a million chance. Again, nothing to worry about. Now NASA is even claiming plutonium isn't so dangerous. If that's so, why then is NASA in its environmental impact statement drawing up contingency plans for unprecedented catastrophe? Let me quote NASA's own words. I hope I can find this page quick. They talk in this document of, well, I might not be able to, so let me just read from it, and I have photocopies of the page. They talk about um, banning future agricultural land uses if the plutonium falls out. In fact, they even talk about relocating animals. I wonder if they'll send NASA contingents out with nets to catch the chipmunks and the raccoons. They actually speak in this document of relocating affected human populations, people, permanently. If the plutonium rains down on New York or in Washington or in Miami or, or Berlin or Paris or Beijing. Most importantly, the colossal risk is not necessary. New high-efficiency solar cells developed by the European Space Agency can be used on a redesigned Cassini probe. In fact, the European Space Agency is sending off the Rosetta probe beyond the orbit of Jupiter, beyond the orbit of Jupiter to rendezvous with a comet with solar cells providing about the same amount of electricity as Cassini needs, 500 watts compared to 7545 on Cassini on an average. And speaking of Europe, for members of the foreign press that are here today, and Asia, and South America, and the rest of the world, NASA, in the event of an accident on the Cassini mission or other planned U.S. nuclear shots, and as has been noted, there are many, is using the Price-Anderson Act to limit financial liability for damages. This is a law 
Britain, supposed to be just a temporary law here in the Washington in 1957, passed in 1957, which limits the liability in the event of a nuclear plant accident to 8.9 billion U.S., but only 100 million still, 100 million still for all the rest of the world. All of the people outside of the U.S. could collect for property damage, illness, injury, and death if the plutonium from Cassini rains down on Europe or rains down on Asia or rains down on Latin America, all the people could collect is $100 million. We are now on a countdown to nuclear space disaster. It can happen on Cassini or any of the other shots ahead. It is inevitable. It will happen. The use of nuclear power on space devices is not worth the risk. Let's explore space safely. Let's explore space, but do it safely, not exposing large numbers of people to cancer-causing radiation and rendering a portion of the Earth uninhabitable. Okay, we thank you for your patience, and uh, again, we ask any media people only that have questions, because there's so many here, uh, just media people with questions, please identify your media outlet as you ask questions. I ask all the speakers to come up around the mic, so we'll speed up the answering uh, process. So, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Now, you've tried to stop past probes. How come, what's different about this one? What's different about this one is, uh, in my mind, is two things. One is it's more plutonium than has ever been launched before. And secondly, we have more international opposition than we've ever had before. In the past on Galileo and Ulysses, our campaigns were primarily campaigns in the United States. This time they're global campaigns. We have people all over the world that are now petitioning the president to ask him to, to stop this launch. People in countries all over the planet. Anyone else? Kathy Pollinsworth with Bloomberg News. And I'm wondering about the track record. You spoke about if plutonium has been used in other uh, launches and you suspect that this is going to be inevitable, uh, uh, a crash. So why hasn't it happened before? It has happened before. The SNAP-9A came down in 1964, April of 1964, carrying 2.1 pounds of plutonium. We're talking about plutonium-238, incidentally. This is 280 times more toxic than the plutonium isotope we're familiar with, 239, that's in bombs. 2.1 pounds, so it's 2.1 pounds multiplied by that, by 280. And you see we're talking here about the equivalent of hundreds, thousands of pounds when you talk about the Cassini near the 20,000 pounds of 239. That 2.1 pounds of plutonium-238 dioxide, which came down in 1964, has long been connected by Dr. John Goffman. He's of the University of California. He's a professor emeritus of, radio, of medical physics with an increase of lung cancer on Earth. Uh, other accidents? What's that? What was the name of that? 1964? 1964, the SNAP-9A. There's been 26... U.S. space nuclear missions, three failures. The Soviets, as far as I can determine, 41, six failures. Six failures, including the Russian Mars space probe, half a pound of plutonium that came down, disintegrated on Chile and Bolivia in November of 1996, last November. And many people recall the Mars 96 probe, the Russian probe, which disintegrated, we now know, perhaps over Bolivia, and as you know, as you recall, President Clinton had to get on the telephone to call the Australians. The Australians were very worried that the Mars 96 probe would land on Australia. It's unpredictable. It's, it's very difficult to predict where the impact site will be, even by supercomputers. We now believe that the Mars probe landed in uh, Bolivia. Also, Apollo 13, the famous movie with Tom Hanks. If you read the transcripts of the horrible transmissions between Apollo 13 and Houston, they were deathly afraid of the plutonium on board the Apollo 13 spacecraft would come down with that spacecraft and contaminate large portions of the planet Earth. However, all that was censored and removed from the Hollywood version of the Apollo 13. Now, the difference is we're talking about this is the mother of all space shots with plutonium, 72 pounds. I've redone NASA's calculation using NASA's own methodology. 
I estimate instead of 2,300 people being killed, cancer over 50 years, I get numbers like 200,000. 200,000 people, I estimate, could be killed in such an accident using the same kinds of methodology that NASA uses. So we're playing Russian roulette with the people of the Earth, and the risks to me are simply too great to justify this mission. If you would, if you would just hold your applause, because we want to get everybody in. Thank you very much. Tammy we appreciate Lando the support. From the Go ahead. Orlando Sentinel for um, Alan Cohn. If you could talk a little bit more about what made you change your mind about this. What made, what made me change my mind and step up now? Well, first of all, let me confess something to you. I retired from NASA. Uh, I'm not under, the, uh, under their thumb anymore. I'm not required to think the way they want me to think or say the way they want me to talk. Well, a current NASA employee did speak out, and he's on a three-day suspension without pay. But that's not really the reason why. I just had to get that on the record so they couldn't come back at you with it. The real reason was, as EPO, I was partly opposed by very many people, a very and some very high-ranking people. They were afraid that if we, we did anything to protect the government employees and the employees inside the fences, that the people outside the fences would find out about it and start to worry. And so we were told, do nothing to protect the government employees. Your job is just cosmetic. Just sit there and do nothing, and you, you'll react real, real time. But most of the managers and most of the people were cooperative with me and helped me to get the job done anyway. I was so busy I didn't realize that the 14 to 17, I'm not sure exactly how many, outside government agencies, including DOE, FEMA, Federal uh, Emergency Management Association, Livermore Laboratories, all these people who were on the uh, radiological monitoring teams, really we're not going to do the only thing possible and evacuate all those people, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people with the indefiniteness of a launch on again, off again. The economic dislocation would have been such that uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't have been done. So they were going to only evacuate real time. I found this out afterwards. And if they evacuated real time, Husbands would be, would be looking for wives. Wives would be looking for husbands. Mothers would be running to school to get their children. There would have been gridlock crashes in the streets. Gridlock, nobody would have, no, would, nobody would have been able to escape. And I, quite frankly, I feel guilty about it. That's why I changed my mind. Over here, please. My name is Deborah Zabarenko. I Could you stand up? Reuters. Uh, given the urgency that you talk about with Cassini, any chance of a court challenge this time around? Uh, as, as I said before, we, in 89 and 90, did go into court. And we've been working this time to try to go into court. Uh, you might have heard of a lawyer named Gary, uh, Jerry Spence from Wyoming. His law firm ha has been working with us and also working with some of the public uh, interest law firms in Washington. They've been reviewing for the past weeks the law, the NEPA law is called, National Environmental Policy Act. That would be the law that we would have to sue under. And also another attorney involved was Lanny Sinkin that was our attorney in 89 from the Christic Institute. So all these lawyers together were analyzing the, the NEPA law, and they just came to the conclusion. We had hoped today that we were going to be able to make an announcement that we were going into federal court in Orlando. But the fact of the matter is, the analysis of the current NEPA law, that since our 89 and 90 challenges, that that law has been de denuded. And I will read to you the three main points that the lawyers told me to make today. First of all, that... Uh, First of all, the, one of the major changes is that in order to bring a, stute, uh, uh, bring a suit, standing has been dramatically uh, changed, narrowed, by requiring individualized injury claims as, contracted with, as contrasted with uh, past uh, decisions where you were permitted to have a more general injury claim. Secondly, the ability to examine agency documents, the, the whole discovery process, has been dramatically reduced under NEPA. And finally, and very importantly, arguing that the agency is wrong in its analysis is no longer possible under NEPA. And so their feeling was that the very law that we could sue under, under the uh, Republican-appointed uh, justices and Republican uh, Congress in recent years, there's no, there's no law anymore that we could file under. So a quick, quick follow-up. Given, given that you can't mount a court challenge, 
I know you're going to be presenting petitions and calling on Clinton to delay the flight and, and I guess ultimately redesign the mission. Realistic, what, realistically, what's your chance of doing that? Um, what we have left is the court of public opinion. We have the American people and the people of the world. And at this point, our job, and our job has always been to bring the information to the, to the people. We've got to get the information to the people. And for the longest time, it's been increasingly difficult to do so. And then when they do get the information, oftentimes the distortions that they're hearing from NASA, that plutonium won't hurt you, and et cetera, et cetera, all the things you've heard today have made it difficult. So we have to rely on the people to speak. Go and, ahead. And the press. Without the press, we can't get to the Yeah, and, and let me tell you, it's a pleasure seeing all the press here today. I, I've, again, carried this story for 10 years. The top censored story of last year was in fact, Terry Allen of Covert Action Quarterly is here, was in her magazine by me on the Cassini mission. Progressive Media Project syndicated a column, but I mean, again, since the Challenger loss, I've had the, I got this a Project Sensitive Award. My speech was, the good news, I'm getting this wonderful award. The bad news, I'm getting this a wonderful award. I looked at it, a group of reporters like yourself at the award ceremony, and I said, I mean, to be carrying the story, because it's been cited over and over again, my pieces on this issue, is just outrageous. I believe in a free press, and to paraphrase Henny Youngman, uh, you know, if there's any reporters out there, take my story, please, you know, and, and, and please, you guys, this is some issue in terms of law, and I just would like to mention this because I'd say half of you are from the foreign media. Maybe Nieper has been eviscerated in the United States, but there's another law under which Cassini is legal, and it's called the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And the Outer Space Treaty, and I have it here, says parties shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space. For, and it goes on about it. If there's any mess, if there's any damage, the party responsible has to pay the cost. The United States, since 1991, and again, I got the documentation, has been covering its space nuclear shots under the Price-Anderson Act. So if the stuff, the plutonium comes down, the U.S., in violation of the Outer Space Treaty, blatant violation, will not assume responsibility. And just secondly, might I note, the Outer Space Treaty also prohibits the placement in space of weapons of mass destruction. And a lot of what Cassini is about in terms of why NASA is rejecting the solar option. I mean, the pressure by Lockheed Martin, it makes this stuff. The National Nuclear Laboratories wants to, they want to keep fabricating the stuff, the Department of Energy, but also the military wants to position nuclear-powered space weaponry of devastating destructiveness in space in coming years in total violation of the Outer Space Treaty. I might add that the International Court of Justice is located in the Netherlands at The Hague and at the Court of Appeals is the United Nations Security Council. Yes. Wingspan News. Is there any particular response from Beverly Cook at the U.S. Department of Energy basically saying on this flyby there's a 1 in 1.25 million chance of there being an accident? Is there official response to that? I had a chance to debate <coughs> Beverly Cook on um, National Public Radio and personally I was shocked at her enormous uh, unfounded optimism. She mentioned the fact the RTGs will withstand, for example, 2,100 pounds per square inch. But she very cleverly did not mention that the RTGs have failed uh, when under shrapnel, titanium and aluminum bullets, bullets fired at these RTGs, simulating shrapnel at 1,000 feet per second, <coughs> will pierce these RTGs. So these numbers given by Beverly Cook, I think, are basically fabricated. She admitted, in fact, that these numbers are basically in outer space, a meteorite collision, for example, in outer space. That has never been the limiting problem with our space probes, meteorite collisions in outer space. That's where that number one in a million comes from, by the way. This is one in a million chance of a collision with meteorites. The big problem are solar flares. That's what helped it down Cosmos 1402, okay, which almost hit Central Europe. Or for that matter, human failure, which led to the Mars Observer being exploded, perhaps, over the orbit of Mars. Or simple human failure, which caused the Hubble Space Telescope to have problems. So, uh, or space debris. We, just last month, we had a near collision with a piece of space junk in outer space. None of these things are in this one in a million calculation. And that's why I say these calculations come from fantasy land. They don't belong in a document masquerading as physics. Uh, yes, sir. Larry, <coughs> Larry Lippman with the Palm Beach Post and Cox Newspapers. 
Uh, has there been any kind of an analysis as to what the range of uh, uh, possible contamination could be if there was a launch uh, failure or if it uh, blew up at a certain uh, altitude? Uh, obviously, I'm interested in, you know, how, how much exposure would there be in Florida, in the southeast uh, United States, et cetera? I believe that the NASA final environmental Im impact statement itself, which is available right here in Washington, D.C. at NASA headquarters for, I think, about $9, answers that question. We have copies of that up here. Uh, the Miami Herald, in an article written by Phil Long and Marty Merzer, uh, looked at that same document and said it's a six-county area. but. That doesn't consider the fact that rainstorms would then raise the plutonium again, and it could then spread further from the initial fallout footprint, nor does it uh, include any consideration of uh, groundwater contamin contamination, as I had mentioned in my, my little talk. So who knows? To me, it would mean, to me, it would mean the economic trashing of peninsular Florida the end of tourism, the end of uh, Florida as a convention state, the wiping out of our citrus, the wiping out of our uh, winter vegetables, the finishing of our fishing in industry, and the complete uh, degradation of our real estate. That's what it would mean to me. I do computer simulations of the dispersal of plutonium in the atmosphere. I've gone through the FEIS of NASA. On launch, they assume that most of the plutonium will be concentrated within a few thousand feet of the launch site. However, as you know from the Delta rocket explosion earlier this year in January, debris from the Delta rocket landed 17 miles, up to 17 miles downwind of the site. And that was a reality check for many of the people of Miami. I don't care how many NASA bureaucrats pontificate, the radiation will be concentrated on the launch site. The actual laws of physics show that the winds carry the debris which landed on people's homes, landed on people's clothing. The real reality check was that it landed 70 miles downwind. Cosmos 954, the debris was in a cigar shape ellipse. That's the footprint of an accident. The accident is not concentrated in a site. It makes a footprint, long, cylindrical in shape. It was 600 kilometers long on Cosmos 954 contaminating 124,000 square kilometers of real estate in the Northwest Territories of Canada. These are the computer simulations that I do. These are also the computer simulations that other physicists do. The problem with NASA is they've always assumed the con radiation will be concentrated on the launch site, concentrated to within two square miles of the impact site. And this is where I think they are simply making up the numbers. Reality shows that the winds have already blown debris from the Delta rocket 70 miles downwind. All the way to Vero Beach, I, I would uh, um, remind you on that particular launch that the burning toxic purple cloud from just the gas burning fuel on that Delta rocket went all the way to Vero Beach. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, just a brief point, I've heard some PR from NASA that says, well, the only dangerous time when the plutonium comes down is when it's just at your mouth or your nose level and you breathe it in. And that's not true. I mean, basically, a plutonium dust could stick to your house and then someday you're wiping something off of it. It can be in, in the vegetables, makes, you know, in the backyard, makes gardening a whole kind of different issue in terms of pleasure. It can be um, in, it can be on, on, uh, produce or on things that are burned and therefore relofted into the atmosphere again if you die of cancer and you get cremated somebody else could burn in that particle and also die you get the idea it's not just a one-time thing and in terms of, of, of this numbers game that NASA likes to play I mean look at the Mir space station up there now if it makes it through the afternoon those fellas are lucky I mean accidents will happen in space odds what would the, what was the probability of this fuel leak out of the Centaur rocket six weeks ago from, we're talking now, the Cassini, or this air conditioner failure, which apparently is going to cause the launch, if it's to go ahead, uh, to be postponed for a, a, a couple of weeks. Accidents will happen. Those astronauts, are, they're, they're brave folk, and I give it to them. I respect them. But we're not volunteers. We're not volunteers uh, to, to insert n 
toxic nuclear power into the space equation is absolutely insane. Again, let's explore space. Let's do it safely. Let's not destroy a portion of life on Earth in the process. One thing, I, one comment I'd like to make is, uh, if you look at the Titan rocket that will be launching Cassini, down below are the initial stage rocket engines, and at the top in the nose cone is the Cassini spacecraft. And the RTG, the plutonium generator, sits on the bottom, the very bottom of the Cassini spacecraft. And right below that is the Centaur upper stage rocket. And we believe if there was an initial explosion, malfunction, of the initial rockets, there would likely be a secondary explosion of the Centaur upper stage rocket. So you have a double igni ig uh, igniting, if you will, double fire, flying fragments and everything. And then that RTG sitting there exposed on the bottom of the Cassini spacecraft, right underneath this Centaur rocket, is very vulnerable, we believe, to all these overpressures that would then be created. Another question? Yes. Charles Surly, CNN. What stage of the mission represents the greatest threat, the launch or the flyby? The greatest threat is posed by the flyby. NASA itself admits that 2,300 people could come down with fatal cancer over a 50-year period. NASA admits now that even if the plutonium is in ceramic form with a tough iridium casing and graphite shell, even with all these precautions, over 30% will disintegrate in the upper atmosphere 70% will come plunging down like a flaming meteor, shatter perhaps on a piece of rock, and almost all the plutonium can in fact escape at that point. That's the greatest danger. But NASA gets deliberately low numbers by assuming that once it does crash, it stays concentrated within two square miles. That's why the latest NASA numbers are 120 deaths from this flyby. Now, on a Challenger explosion, type explosion on the launch pad, NASA again gets very small numbers. They admit plutonium will escape. They admit that because, as I mentioned, shrapnel, titanium bullets will go right through these RTGs, simulating shrapnel. They admit plutonium will come out. But again, these numbers are very small for deaths because they assume that almost all the plutonium will be concentrated within a few thousand feet of the launch site. Okay? That's why they get less than one person dying of cancer in a Challenger-type explosion. My answer is reality check. The reality is that the winds blow this debris for hundreds of miles, as we know from Chernobyl or from other nuclear accidents. We have a long history of nuclear accidents. We know that debris can be blown. In fact, in Chernobyl's case, a few thousand miles. In New York City, we got small debris from the Chernobyl accident. It was picked up in the milk. Okay, a friend of mine monitors the milk in New York City. Very small amount was picked up from Chernobyl. So we do know the winds blow this material. Unfortunately, NASA has not factored in the winds in a lot of, their, a lot of these computer programs. Another question, anyone? I think that's it. We just have a closing word, one word minute from uh, Louise here. Oh, I'm a school teacher from Washington. Louise, why don't you come over here in front of here? school teacher from Washington DC which means you know how sad it is our situation but there are other situations which are much sadder and that is concerning Cassini and so I want to say just a few words to you about my children uh, who are now grown up and have children of their own uh, lived in a portion of Washington out by the Potomac River and they were playing in the grounds when a plane came over their heads and settled down there. And I rushed to grab them to come away. Uh, the plane, noticing that there was turmoil, uh, withdrew. But we knew at that time that they were trying uh, experiments. And so uh, I never let my children ever go on that lawn again, though it was right at the edge of Washington on the northwest side. and. Uh, right by the canal that goes through. So um, they had a first-hand experience, and they have never gotten over it, never. They never have spoken of it. They won't speak of it. They won't even think about it. It was so horrible. So please, don't let your children get in that position. And I thank you for hearing me out. I'm still a good school teacher in a way. <laughs> Yeah, we're now going to the White House uh, for a vigil.